Hey, Wiki Watchers, my name is Dad Boys in the Hood, and welcome to The Search for D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper. And once again, we are joined by the one, the only, lovely Akira. So... Oh my gosh, my hand. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so since, since we... Since this is set in the US, I thought I'd go with the Golden Gate Bridge and Akira in space, as always. <laughs> but anyways... Also, also, an honourable um, thing that I should mention is that I wanted to go with the shorter video, but Mr. Luca decided that we should put everyone through the 30-minute video with stops. So if the video is about 55 minutes long, I'm really sorry. It's not my fault. Just thought I should mention that. Thank you. <laughs> but anyways, guys, so this is a story about D.B. Cooper, a famous person who hijacked a plane and got away with millions. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. no one knows his true identity. No one knows who he is. The only name that was given to him by the media was D.B. Cooper. So we are going to find out a bit more about D.B. Cooper himself and what his motive was to hijack a plane and get away with millions and why he was never found. And this is one of those cold cases that remain unsolved to this very day. Let's watch the video! Oh, hold on, I, I, need, I need to click it. Just let me know. A daring parachute escape from a flying 727 somewhere between wings. A search was made of the plane immediately. We don't know who he was, where he came from or where he went. I expect that we'll keep looking uh, until we find him or find out what happened. In the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, a middle-aged man carrying a briefcase walked into Portland International Airport and purchased a one-way ticket to Seattle, Washington. The man identified himself as Dan Cooper, and along with 36 other passengers and a crew of six, he soon boarded Northwest Airlines Flight 305. Once aboard, Cooper made himself comfortable in the middle of the last row of seats on the right side of the cabin. He ordered a drink and had a smoke, because this was the 70s. The drink that I can tell you is he had a burgundy... A bourbon, it was a bourbon soda. Bourbon soda. And back in those days, you were allowed to smoke. On their, on their lines, yeah. On airlines, but now you're not. But anyways, let's continue and get more information on the hijacking. Once the flight was cleared for departure, Cooper turned around and handed an envelope to flight attendant Florence Schaffner. Inside the envelope was a note featuring a handwritten message stating he had a bomb. Schaffner reluctantly sat down beside him and glimpsed what appeared to be eight sticks of dynamite inside his briefcase. Cooper's demands were quite simple. He wanted $200,000 in cash and four parachutes. He also demanded a fuel truck to stand ready to refuel the aircraft once they landed in Seattle. Should they fail to comply with his demands, he threatened to quote, do the job. Once the flight was airborne, Schaffner went to inform the cockpit crew, while another flight attendant by the name of Tina Mucklow remained by Cooper's side. By using a telephone in the rear of the cabin, Mucklow acted as an intermediary between Cooper and the rest of the flight crew for the remainder of the hijacking. For the next hour and a half, Flight 305 maintained a holding pattern near Seattle, while local and federal authorities scrambled to procure the ransom as well as the four parachutes. $10,020 bills were collected from a local bank, 
while the owner of a nearby skydiving school supplied the chutes. At 5.45 p.m., more than two hours past its scheduled arrival, Fly 305 finally touched down in Seattle. By this point, it was well after sunset, and the aircraft was brought to a remote section of the tarmac. Once the flight came to a stop, both the ransom and the parachutes were handed over to Mucklow, who then brought them back aboard. In exchange, Cooper permitted two of the flight attendants, as well as all the passengers, to disembark, many of whom had not yet realized the flight had been hijacked. With the ransom paid and only four crew members remaining on board, Cooper told Mucklow to inform the captain that he wanted to fly to Mexico City. They were to fly with the landing gear down, the flaps at 15 degrees and below 10,000 feet. The lights in the cabin were to be switched off, and the aft stairway, which opens from the underbelly of the fuselage, was to remain extended. Two of Cooper's demands could not be satisfied. First of all, the flight configuration he'd requested would not allow for a non-stop flight to Mexico City. As such, Cooper proposed a refueling stop in Phoenix, Yuma or Sacramento before they all agreed on Reno, Nevada. Second of all, it was not possible to depart with a ventral staircase extended. Cooper agreed to retract the stairs on the condition that Mucklow remained by his side and taught him how to extend them once the plane was airborne. Parked for nearly two hours due to complications with refueling, Flight 305 was back in the air by 7.36 p.m. Less than five minutes after takeoff, Cooper told Mucklow to head for the cockpit and that from this point onwards, he was not to be disturbed. The last time she saw Cooper, he was standing in the middle of the aisle as if though he was preparing to jump. Mucklow joined the rest of the crew, locked the cockpit door behind her, and some three hours later, Flight 305 safely landed in Reno. Once the flight came to a stop, the crew carefully ventured into the rear of the cabin, but there was no sign of Cooper, nor the bomb. The aft stairway had been extended mid-flight and was slightly damaged upon landing. It seemed there was only one explanation for the hijacker's absence. At some point between Seattle and Reno, Cooper had strapped on a parachute, walked down the stairs, and leaped into the dark of night. So that's how he did it. But this goes on for months and months and months just to find this guy, which he will now explain in The Manhunt. Because every part of the US were looking for this guy. They had no idea what he looked like, who he was, what his real name was and why he got away with that amount of money. Basically, nobody knows if he's still alive or if he's dead. But I think he's dead, because there's no way he's probably alive and he got away with that amount of money. I mean, that's what I I'd mean, he was, he was very smart about it. Like... I mean, telling them, like, where to go, like, where to yeah. refuel, um, teaching him how to extend the, the staircase, teaching him how to, like, all that stuff, and, like, making the, the flight attendants all go into the cockpit so they wouldn't know when he jumped out or, like, where, like, whereabouts he jumped out. So it's, hard, it's much harder for them to find this person, obviously, because of all the, the steps he took to, like, hide where he went. Mm. But... And also, even the details of how high the, the plane flew, like he was at a good distance that he wouldn't like die if he jumped out the airplane with the parachute on. Yeah, it was. But I think what I do recall is that on that on that day, he jumped out the plane. I think I believe it was raining really badly on that day, uh, if I can recall from other other previous I videos. Think so. I think so as well. Other previous videos to this that I've watched, uh, mm -hmm. but this is the main one which I want to watch and it is fascinating. So I decided to watch it with someone else. But anyways, let's get on with the manhunt. 
As soon as it became clear that Cooper was no longer on board, dozens of FBI agents converged upon the aircraft, only to discover a disappointing amount of physical evidence. A black clip-on tie, eight cigarette butts, and two of the four parachutes were all that Cooper left behind. Evidently, he'd brought the ransom and briefcase along with him. In interviews conducted on the night of the hijacking, Cooper was described by the crew and passengers as a white male with brown eyes and dark hair. He appeared to be in his mid-40s and wore a dark trench coat, a dark suit, a white shirt, a black tie, and dark shoes. Soon after boarding, he'd also donned a pair of sunglasses. Based on this description, the FBI produced the first of several composite sketches. Before they could mount a search, however, the FBI had to figure out when Cooper abandoned ship. But that was easier said than done. None of the four crew members witnessed Cooper jumping from the plane, nor did the pilots of two fighter jets which escorted the flight between Seattle and Reno, which is not all too surprising given it was the middle of the night. Although the flight crew did report something odd, the last communication with the hijacker occurred at approximately 8.05 p.m. when the crew used the intercom to offer assistance which Cooper declined. Within the next 10 minutes, the crew experienced what they described as an oscillation or vibration of the aircraft. At the time, the crew suspected it might have been produced by Cooper. Sorry, just to go over that part. Wouldn't... Wouldn't they have, like, recordings of those? Well, it was a long time ago. I'm sure they didn't have that, that type of, like... What's it yeah, called? but couldn't they... Could they not, like, at that time. Yeah, they could like, still, like, listen back to them if they had them, though. And, like, get an idea what he sounded like. But since, since he mentioned cigarette butts... That they had have his DNA. Unless he, unless he was smart about that as well. Unless he decided maybe he was wearing gloves so they couldn't get his DNA. Yeah, but they have his DNA because you have to smoke. You have to put it in your mouth to smoke it. Mm. But also, did you realize that in the other video, it said that the, the flight attendants or like was it the pilot, he sent a signal to Mexico that the, that the flight was hijacked. And in this video, it didn't show that. Mm. I think I think they'll probably get to that at some point in the video. Yeah. But anyways, let's continue. Cooper's jump and a subsequent recreation of the hijacking supported that conclusion. Okay, so that took care of the when, but what about the where? While Cooper was very explicit about the flight's configuration and destination, he never specified any kind of route. In fact, Cooper grew so impatient with the slow refueling in Seattle that he dismissed the captain's request to file a flight plan and simply told him to quote, get the show on the road. As such, the captain chose to fly along an airway known as Victor 23 without any input from Cooper. By using Victor 23 as a guide, authorities estimated the most probable location of the flight at the approximated time of the jump was about 40 kilometers north of Portland. And so, at the break of dawn, the FBI mounted an impressive search operation using helicopters, airplanes, and ground troops. The problem was, even if the estimated bailout point was accurate, Cooper's eventual landing or drop zone was far more difficult to pinpoint. The loosely defined search area covered a vast stretch of mountainous wilderness occluded by a dense forest, so it was truly like finding a needle in a haystack. Apart from the difficult terrain, the search was further complicated by low temperatures and inclement weather, which persisted for days. Despite their best efforts, authorities never managed to find a single trace of Cooper, nor the items he'd brought along with him. Greetings. Uh, bear with us one. Chapter three. Let's see. Follow the money. De Monet. Why follow the money? <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Oh, wait. Oh, Kira's got something. I was thinking <laughs> they're going to they're gonna see it. They're going to check where 
Oh! Where I was put... the description of the man uh, spending the money to see like what places he's gone to so they can try to track him down? As I do recall in certain other histories that I've seen of people reacting to this video, I do know that the FBI were smart. I be they did take the serial numbers because on the US dollar bills you have like those uh, on, I think on every one that you have, you've got like these little serial numbers at the bottom of the, of the, of the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. I see where you're going there, Akira. Yeah. Let's follow the money. Having made little to no progress by early December, the FBI turned their attention to the two hundred thousand dollar ransom. The money had been collected from the Seattle First National Bank, which maintained a ransom package of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars just for such an occasion. Because of this, the serial numbers of the $10,020 banknotes given to Cooper had been documented in advance, a complete list of which were quickly made available to financial institutions, government agencies, and the general public. The intention was to make it as difficult as possible for Cooper to spend his money. Northwest Airlines and several newspapers even began to offer rewards to anyone who could find a note with a matching serial number. In spite of these efforts, no one ever did. That is until nearly a decade later. In early 1980, a young boy named Brian Ingram was building a campfire on a small beach in southern Washington. As he was digging into the sand, Ingram discovered three bundles of cash totaling $5,880. Having heard about the infamous skyjacking, Ingram's parents brought the severely degraded bundles to the FBI. The notes were promptly inspected, and sure enough, the serial numbers matched those of the ransom. Once the excitement subsided, however, the money managed to raise far more questions than it answered, the most significant of which was how. How did the money end up so far away from the drop zone? Looking at this map, it might be tempting to think that Cooper simply dropped some of the money, which then fell into the Lewis River. The bundles could then have been carried further downstream by the Columbia River before finally being washed ashore at Tina Bar, which is the name of the beach. Tina Mucklo, Tina Bar, coincidence? Yeah, coincidence. Anyway, the problem with this idea is that the Columbia River flows in the opposite direction. This has led some, including members of the FBI, to re-evaluate initial drop zone assessment. For instance, if the drop zone was much further southeast, close to a river called the Washougal River, it is conceivable, albeit improbable, that the money floated all the way down to Tina Bar. Alternatively, the bundles may have simply landed on the beach if the flight path was further to the west. Even so, natural explanations struggle to explain how three independent, potentially free-falling and or free-floating bundles of cash ended up at the exact same place on the same beach. To complicate matters, sediment from the riverbed was excavated and dumped onto Tina Bar as part of a dredging operation in 1974. And according to one analysis, the money was discovered above this layer of sediment. If true, that would mean the money came to rest at Tina Bar sometime after 1974. But a re-examination of that analysis found that what was believed to be a layer of deposited sediment might actually have been a perfectly natural layer of clay. Not only that, but the sediment was clearly dumped some distance away from where the money was discovered. Furthermore, when Ingram discovered the bundles, the rubber bands which held them together were still intact. This is significant because experiments conducted in 2009 revealed that this brand of rubber bands could not withstand exposure to open air or water for more than a year. So, unless the bundles were somehow protected from the elements, they must have become buried at Tina Bar within a year of the hijacking. The most probable explanation, therefore, seems to be that I mean... They're really smart about how, they hand how they're handling the situation, like, conducting tests, like... Obviously, because of the rubber band thing, there's no way that the money would have been there for a decade. Yeah, because I... I... Obviously... I mean, if I were in his position, I would just gamble the money so I can receive more, and then I would have dumped it. So he probably did something like that to get more money so he can, like, 
you know, be able to yeah, do stuff the, still and like yeah, stay but the serial, but those serial numbers matched the uh, the, the all I, the other I was numbers. Saying, I was saying that he must have gambled some to get more money, uh, so he can dump that money, and he would still have enough to I still mean, live. I mean, he could have he could have been smart about it. He could have made his way there, got there safely. Or who knows, he could be dead at this point, but we don't know that. He could have made a little hole and planted it there himself. Because how yeah, else... Because how, how else would the rubber bands still be intact? Yeah, that's what I'm saying to you. Like, the money must have not been there for, like, that long. Like, mm. but the thing I don't understand is that they're saying that the rubber bands wouldn't withstand over a year of being exposed like that. But the money itself was ruined. Like, it was in shambles. But the rubber bands were still intact. That's why I don't understand. So it's obvious he must have tried to somehow destroy them so that no one would know the serial numbers on the, on the, on the dollar mm -hmm. bills. And plant them on Tia Beach. Tina, Tina or Tia, whatever. Tina, uh, Tina. Tina Beach. That could be the main reason of the of that. But anyways, let's continue watching it. That Cooper or someone else deliberately buried the money. Did Cooper survive? That's what we just said. <laughs> sure Did Cooper bury the money himself? Did someone else bury the money after stumbling upon Cooper's remains? If there is an explanation which does not require human intervention, it's managed to elude investigators for decades. Suffice it to say, this is a mystery within a mystery. Since Ingram's discovery in 1980, both Tina Bar and the grounds around the Bushugal River have been subjected to numerous searches, but to date, there's been no sign of Cooper, nor the rest of the money. Chapter 4 a leap of faith I don't I don't really know how I would subs like describe this one to be practically honest I mean it could be to do with he's going to go back to the plane and then he's going to go from there to see what exactly happened. But anyways, let's uh, see what he says about a leap of faith. From the very beginning, it was assumed by many that Cooper did not survive his daring escape. It would not make for a very thrilling conclusion to this story, but that's the thing about stories, they're usually far more exciting than reality. While there is no hard evidence for nor against Cooper's survival, the assumption that he fell to his death is not without merit. When Cooper leaped into the darkness, Flight 305 was plowing through a frigid rainstorm at roughly 170 knots, 10,000 feet above southern Washington. The wind was so violent that it ripped out a placard from the aft stairway, which was later recovered in 1978 almost directly below the estimated flight path. To say that Cooper was not dressed for the occasion it would be an understatement. The ground beneath him, meanwhile, was obscured by multiple layers of clouds, which likely means that Cooper jumped without knowing his precise location. Even if he could see the ground and had a specific drop zone in mind, the parachute he selected was non-steerable, meaning he would not have been able to steer his descent towards a specific landing spot, thus precluding any potential coordination with an accomplice stationed on the ground. While Cooper expressed some familiarity with parachutes, his actual competence level is up for debate. It's widely believed that Cooper demanded two pairs of parachutes, two primary and two reserve, to make the authorities believe that he intended to take a hostage. That is precisely what happened as the FBI contemplated, but eventually decided against sabotaging the chutes as they did not want to risk the life of an innocent civilian. But in their haste to obtain them, they unintentionally provided Cooper with a non-functional dummy chute intended for training purposes. This mishap seems to have gone unnoticed by Cooper because that dummy chute was one of the two missing from the plane. 
Not only that, but Cooper chose the older and technically inferior parachute out of the two primary chutes provided. So in both cases, it seems like Cooper made the worst possible. So, two of them were primary. Two of them were reserve chutes. So yeah, that would make sense. What if one of the reserve ones would be? I mean, they were smart though to have put that wood in there though. Mhm. Mm but I feel like so obviously he didn't have an accomplice on the ground because you know he couldn't steer the the parachute to where the person was. So obviously he had no idea where he was landing, but. He just decided to land wherever. Hmm. But, but by doing that, it's even harder for the police to actually figure out where he landed because he even he himself didn't know where he was going to land. Hmm. That's why it's one of the world's most interesting cold cases in US history. Mm -hmm. Possible choice. But there are other ways to interpret this information. For instance, it's possible that Cooper used the dummy chute not as a reserve, but as a means to secure the bag of money. In fact, that is precisely what Cooper tried to do with the functional reserve chute. First, he tried to place the money in the chute's canopy before removing some of the suspension lines and wrap them around the bag. Perhaps he used the dummy chute for a similar purpose. And Cooper's decision to use the older primary chute is not necessarily an indication of inexperience. It could also be a sign of familiarity because the chute he left behind was a civilian luxury chute, while the one he used was a military chute. The argument is that Cooper might have been trained as, say, a paratrooper, and chose the older military chute because that's the one with which he was most familiar. And there is at least one other reason to suspect that Cooper had a military background. While the flight was in a holding pattern near Seattle, Cooper mentioned that the McCord Air Force Base was only 20 minutes away from the Seattle-Tacoma Airport. At the time, that was an accurate assessment and might suggest a military background. Apart from the potential military connections, Cooper may even have had links to the Central Intelligence Agency. You see, the type of aircraft which Cooper chose to hijack, a Boeing 727, was also used by the CIA to covertly drop agents and supplies during the Vietnam War a task for which the Boeing 727 was uniquely qualified due to its distinctive aft stairway. So it's fairly safe to assume that Cooper chose to hijack a Boeing 727 specifically because it provided a relatively safe means of escape. Whether he learned of this from the CIA or came to that conclusion independently is another question. However, the fact that Cooper chose to hijack a flight operated by Northwest Airlines was apparently random chance. When Tina Mucklow asked Cooper about his motives, he responded, It's not because I have a grudge towards your airline, it's just because I have a grudge. He further clarified that Flight 305 just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Even so, it's clear that Cooper came prepared. He seemed to know a great deal about aircraft and aviation, he appeared to be familiar with the local terrain, he maintained a low profile to avoid a panic, he covered his eyes with a pair of glasses to conceal his identity, he left very little evidence behind, and he demanded four parachutes to force the assumption that he was taking a hostage. He was even cunning enough to reclaim the note which he'd initially given to Florence Schaffner. Apart from the name he wrote on his plane ticket, there are no other samples of Cooper's handwriting. But for all his planning and cunning, it seems Cooper did not give enough thought to his eventual escape. Not only did he fail to specify a route, but he was forced to make a last-minute destination change from Mexico City to Reno. He could have demanded more appropriate parachuting equipment like a pair of boots, a helmet, or jumpsuit. He could even have specified the ransom to be delivered in larger denominations to make it lighter and less cumbersome to carry. Presuming he did survive the fall and made it safely to the ground, he may then have had to make his way through a dense, partially snow-covered forest in nothing but loafers and a trench coat in late November. I get the distinct impression that Cooper's escape was much more of a leap of faith than a carefully executed jump. On the other hand, authorities never received a missing persons report matching the description of Cooper in the wake of the hijacking. This might suggest that Cooper did survive and that he swiftly and quietly resumed his normal routine. Furthermore, other hijackers have performed similar stunts and many of them did survive, even if they were quickly apprehended. 
Finally, the simplest explanation for how three bundles of cash ended up at Tina Bar is human intervention. At the end of the day, most of this is based on nothing but supposition. Without any concrete evidence of Cooper's demise, it leaves the door wide open to the far more exciting proposition that he... That's... <sighs> Interesting. But anyways, if you guys give us a minute, we will be back. Hold on. We're back, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, wait. Oh my god. Okay. Fixed it. Akira's just trying to, you know... Look at this, okay? Right? Fix her background. Yeah, where are my arms? Where are my arms? Where are they? No, That's where I have to put this. There we go. There! Okay. Let's, Let's continue. Go on the video. Evidence of Cooper's demise? It leaves the door wide open to the far more exciting proposition that he did, in fact, survive. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. The, Chap the suspects. Chapter I was about to say the suspects. <laughs> the, sus the suspects. The suspects. Why'd you say it like that? The suspects. <laughs> The suspects. Number 15. Burger oh, King no. foot lettuce. <laughs> no, stop it. <laughs> That's what I tried to sound like when I said that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Guys, I, I made a DIY um heat pad. And <laughs> you see me holding it. Just know <laughs> that's what it is. So, don't ask questions, okay? Thanks. I have a question. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm, no, I don't. The suspects. Hmm. Who could they be? Well, there's only one person who'd be able to identify the suspects with a, with a, with the snap of a finger. You know who that is? Akira. Scooby Dooby Doo, where are you? Are we you? got some work for you. Yeah. To do now. Okay, but anyways, that was it. Let's uh, just continue. Yeah. By the time the press got wind of the hijacking, the FBI had already begun to investigate a few potential suspects. Among them was a man in Portland with initials DB and surname Cooper. This Cooper was quickly eliminated as a suspect, but due to a mix-up by the press, the name Dan Cooper was confused for D.B. Cooper, and the rest is history. While Dan Cooper is most likely a pseudonym, there is a comic book series of the same name. The comic is written in French and centers around a Canadian pilot named Dan Cooper. While the comic was not translated into English nor sold in the United States before 1971, it was available in Canada, which has a large French-speaking population. Given that American and Canadian accents can be difficult to distinguish, it's possible that Cooper, who was described as having no discernible accent, was a bilingual Canadian. This might even be supported by something that Cooper might have said. You see, when the captain relayed Cooper's demands to air traffic control, he used the phrase negotiable American currency. It seems doubtful that an American citizen would specify American currency, so perhaps Cooper was not American. The problem is, we don't know if this is a direct quote from Cooper or paraphrasing by the captain. For instance, notes taken by the crew during the hijacking merely contain the phrase negotiable currency, while testimonies provided by the crew after the hijacking include phrases like $200,000 in cash and circulated US currency. So, Cooper might have been Canadian, and he might have taken his name from the Dan Cooper comics, just as he might have been American, and might have taken his name from something or someone else. Nearly half a century has gone by since the hijacking took place, and in that time, thousands of suspects have been questioned and investigated. It would obviously be impossible to cover all of them here, but let's take a look at some of the people that at some point or another have been suspected of being D.B. Cooper.
Robert Rackstraw first became a suspect in 1978 and on <laughs> Look at I'm sorry. Look at the drawing and look at how close that drawing is to that. It is actually the hair and everything. But the only the only difference of it is it's just, you know, like cuz his chin's like that while the one in the picture is just a little bit more yeah, lower. But the thing is, right, when um, sketch artists draw people, they don't actually see the person. They just describe, they just draw off on, off, uh, yeah, yeah, off on the description yeah, yeah, yeah. that other people have made. So obviously it won't be that accurate. Mm. But they, they do look very much alike, to be really honest with you, the hair and everything. Yeah. Even the ears, actually. Yeah, even, also the nose as well a bit. No, but the ear, look at the ears and the and the hair. Like that's just completely accurate. Yeah, it is. That's insane. Mhm. Mm I mean, I I don't blame the FBI to bring Robert Rackshaw in as a suspect. Mhm. Mm yeah, they look very much alike, but it looks like Robert has more bluish eyes, like from that draw from that picture. I don't know. He looks like he has lighter yeah, eyes. Yeah, even even though it's in black and white, it does it does. You um, can tell it looks a bit lighter. Well, well in this brown. one, it's it's more brown. So mm -hmm. let's see what he has to say about Robert W. Rackshaw. That's a horrible last name. I'm not gonna lie. Rackshaw. Rack. Rackshaw. Rack. It's Rackshaw. It's not even Rackshaw. Rackstraw. It's horrible. Rackstraw. I mean, it's not as bad as Chris Pratt. <laughs> Chris Pratt is not that bad. It's it's all right, but. Mm. Rack Rackstraw. <laughs> We're just trying to say that one <laughs> line. <laughs> Anyways, let's uh, see. Rackstraw. Imagine naming your child that. Anyways, let's continue this. The surface, he seems like a solid candidate. He was a decorated army paratrooper and helicopter pilot. He had experience with explosives. He had an extensive criminal record. He had an uncle named John Cooper who was an avid skydiver. He was expelled from the army only months before the hijacking, which might suggest a motive. After all, the hijacker did say he had a grudge. When confronted... I'm sorry, but that does sort of make, make sense it, make it a little bit suspicious as well because it because if he knew how to use a bomb if he had a military background and he was a paratrooper in the army it does make sense a lot so He could be the main suspect for it, but or, but is he though? I guess we'll Possibly. find out. Hunted by journalists and private investigators, Rackstraw would neither confirm nor outright deny that he was D.B. Cooper. Instead, he'd say things like, I could have been or I would not discount myself. On the other hand, Rackstraw had light-colored eyes, which Cooper did not. More significantly, Rackstraw was only 28 years of age at the time of the hijacking. This is well outside the range of ages reported by the crew and passengers, most of whom believed Cooper was in his mid-40s. Kenneth Christensen first became a suspect in 2003 when his brother noticed... Mm, I, no, you can Look at the hairline! The lips are kind of similar. The chin structure is kind of the, kind of similar. The ears as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. The ears, the eyes make sense. Um, yeah, th this guy looks much more like the, like he could be the suspect. Look at it, and he's also he must be a pilot because look at his look what he's wearing. His uniform. So he obviously knew, but but the thing is, if he was a pilot, he would know how to operate the the staircase yeah. obviously so it, so it can't be him though 
and he would also know about parachutes. He would obviously knew, he would know if, which which parachutes to take if he was going to jump off the airplane. So there's no way that this is the suspect, even though he does fit the description a lot. The dude. Certain the parallels what? between him. Huh? What did you just say? The dude. <laughs> <laughs> and Cooper. Continue. Christensen had briefly served as a paratrooper in World War II, and since 1953... Uh, makes sense. I keep going. ...he'd worked for Northwest Airlines as both a mechanic and a flight attendant. <gasps> makes sense. Keep going. Mm -hmm. He was 45 years old at the time of the hijacking. So did he do it? He was left-handed, which Cooper might have been. For instance, Cooper used his left hand to interact with his briefcase, and the clip-on tie he left on board was affixed with a tie clasp applied from the left. Shortly before he died in 1994, Christensen had... Mm. I mean, it's, it's all starting to still, add up. I don't understand. Listen, he could have easily, like, pretended to not know how to work the stairs or this and that, like... To intentionally like throw people off his track. Yeah, playing dumb. So, mm -hmm. he told he told his brother he had a had supposedly told his brother there is something you should know, but I cannot tell you. After his passing, his family discovered over two hundred thousand dollars in his bank accounts. Okay, hold up, that is suspicious. But he did work for airlines. True. He must have had money. Yeah, but think about it. If he was but like, but like that. Wait, how long ago was this? Nineteen something. Nineteen seventy-one. Nineteen sixty. Um, the current. When it happened. It's a, he, no. It says he was forty-five year, years old in nineteen seventy-one. Yeah. In when the hijacking yeah. happened. So, the currency must have been, like, much higher then. Mm. So, two, $200,000 is a lot of money to have. So yeah, It I must mean, have been yeah. a lot of money to have. So, I don't think he would get that much money from working in an airline. Yeah, exactly. There's no way he would have got that, that amount just for being an engineer for North. And I'm North sure Carolina. airlines would have recognized him if... Like, the, the people would have recognized him from, from working in the airline. Mm. I'm sure. Exactly. That's why it's a little bit suspicious how they bring in mm -hmm. that bit of money. Yeah. To top it all off, Florence Schaffner stated that photographs of Christensen bore a strong resemblance to Cooper. On the other hand, Christensen did not match the physical description of Cooper. He was both shorter and lighter. While Schaffner did see a strong resemblance, she remarked that Cooper had more hair, and that is supported by the composite sketches. And there was nothing suspicious about the large sums of money which he'd simply earned by selling land. Richard McCoy first became a suspect in 1972 when he... He looks a lot like him. Mm. As well. Instant thing, hairline, eyes look exactly the same. Nose, yeah, okay, nose, ears. nose, not so much. Ears, uh, all right. Chin, the lips, definitely. The chin is yeah. quite accurate, yeah. Even the outfit, look at the outfit he's wearing in that photo. Yeah. And it was taken in 1973. And the uh, hijacking happened in 1971, I believe. 1961, Portland. 71. 1961, that's when the whole thing happened. Okay, but they were and saying, it, okay, wait. And then it went, and then the whole investigation went on for months and months and months and months and months and months and months. And months. That's why it took them so the long. The thing is, they, they said that, the, the, what you call it, D.B. Cooper looked around 40, 40, 45 years old when he was on the plane. And, and that, and they were saying, they were, they were like comparing the guy, the old, the, the guy that was in the last slide 
to D.B. Cooper and they said in 1971, that guy was 45. So he matched the description. So obviously they were talking about, anyways, this is irrelevant. We're chatting, you know, Hold on, bear random with, stuff right bear, now. Bear, bear with me a second. I'm just finding. What he's trying are. to prove me wrong. He's trying to prove me wrong. That's what he's doing. Look at him. I'm not. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Luca likes to bully me. He likes to bully me. So yeah, please send help. Um, send a message to five 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 seven 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 six four three. Um, send the message. Save Akira. And put the hashtag justice for Akira when you send that message. Thank you. Look at him, he's so focused. Luca, would you like to pause the video, search your stuff, and then continue? Well, I've, already, still I've already found it. So DB Cooper is a media da 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 used to refer to da 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 Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. Oh. <laughs> I was right, wasn't I? Say it. On the afternoon of November 24th, 1971, he... Thank you. Told you I was right. I'm always right. I'm always right. Don't ever listen to Luca. Jokes. He's very smart. He's very smart. Okay, Luca, you were wrong. Come, let's let's continue the video. I will now admit that I am wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. We have another seven minutes. Oh my god, Luca, you're so stupid. <laughs> anyway. Should we take a short break? Anyways. We'll be back. Stand by. Stand by. We're having some technical difficulties. We are back. Where we left off, we were currently discussing these two pictures on how on earth they look exactly the same. And also, also where we left off, there was me being an absolute idiot saying 1961. Well, the whole time, Akira was right with 1971. Thank you. Anyways, let's continue. <laughs> Hijacked a Boeing 727 and escaped via the aft stairway, much like D.B. Cooper. Because of the significant overlap between the two hijackings, some believe they must have been committed by the... I'm sorry, what year? In 1972, a year after. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Continue. Same person. McCoy used a fake name. He used a fake hand grenade to threaten the crew. He used handwritten notes to issue his demands. Both McCoy and Cooper used the phrase no funny stuff as a warning to the crew. McCoy demanded five hundred thousand dollars in cash and four. P so wait, DB Coop. So wait, let's get something straight here for a minute. <laughs> DB Cooper asked for two hundred thousand in cash, while Richard F. McCoy Jr. asked for five hundred. I mean, like I, I said to you, he wanted to dispose of the money because, you know, he knew that they were looking for it. Maybe that's why he asked for extra money. I don't know. I don't know why you would need seven thousand, seven hundred thousand dollars I mean, but w would it be possible that for over a year, a guy late somehow magically lived uh, for that long, and he decided to do it again. 
That's logical. In 1972. I mean, it... I mean, I still feel like he is the guy, but... Because he's done the exact same thing. He's used a fake... Well, <laughs> well actually, no. D.B. Cooper... Used a fake name. He used a fake name. D.B. Cooper's bomb was real, I th- believe. But he yeah, had... but actually we don't know. We don't know that. Yeah, we don't know. Could I? It didn't say if it was fake? real or not. Yeah. So he said he used a fake grenade. Was it a fake grenade? Was it that? Yeah. Used an explosive he... device. Mm-hmm. Used handwritten notes. Used the phrases "no funny stuff" like DB Cooper did, and and he demanded the parachutes as well, just like DB Cooper did. Yeah. And that was a year later after DB mm-hmm. was hijacking. So, so far, this guy... Seems to be most like DB Cooper than the other ones. Hmm. He seems to be like the prime suspect. Anyways, let's continue to see what he has to say. Parachutes. McCoy also bailed out the back of the plane once they passed over his hometown in the state of Utah. Apart from the similar modus operandi, McCoy had also served in the Vietnam War as a demolitions expert and a helicopter pilot. McCoy did actually survive the fall and managed to evade authorities for two full days before he was apprehended and sentenced to 45 years in prison. Before his death in 1974, McCoy refused to confirm or deny that he was D.B. Cooper. On the other hand, McCoy was... Yeah, but that raises... Big suspicion alarm bells there, because D.B. Cooper was never caught while he was. Yeah, but they don't know it. They don't know who D.B. Cooper is. They don't know if it it could be that guy. It could be this guy, and he obviously died. So it could have been D.B. Cooper the whole time. That's what I mean. It could have been, basically, D.B. Cooper could be anyone. Like, for instance, it could be me. It could be Akira. It could be Donald Trump for all we care. Wait, we don't. We don't. But, we're not the right age, Luca. I'm no. I'm. I'm just saying that as an example. Obviously, it could be literally anybody. Exactly, it could literally be anyone. It could be that anyone, matches that description. Yeah, it could be anyone within their f- Akira. Yeah. That means our dads could have been DB Cooper. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm just... our, gr- our grandparents could be DB Cooper. No, yeah, fair enough. Because you'd have to be 45 in 1971, and my dad is 54. And so, and it's 2021. So it could be my grand, uh, it could be our grandparents. Exactly. Like, like it could be anyone. So, anyways, what else does he have to say about Richard F. McCoy Jr.? Was an avid recreational skydiver and even came prepared with a skydiving helmet and jumpsuit. He gave very specific instructions about the flight path. In addition to the fake hand grenade, McCoy also used an unloaded handgun to threaten the crew. DB Cooper didn't use that, so. He failed to retrieve. Huh? Yeah, he... I'm just looking at what it said. He specified a flight path. But the thing is, right? It, it could have still been DB Cooper and he could have learnt from the experience the first time that he had to have a flight path. Because the first time he didn't and he didn't have a flight path, he just told him to do whatever. Like, obviously, he learned from his experience. Mm. Then, he was an experienced uh, skydiver, uh, while yeah, Cooper was yeah. likely not. Yeah, but then he, died, then he died three years later. Mm-hmm. No, sorry, not three years later. Two years later. <sighs> he died in 1974. Was it? So there is... Well, yeah, he did. 
So there is a still a high chance that Richard F. McCoy Jr. could be the infamous. And they found the money like, almost a decade after. So it doesn't make sense unless someone else disposed of the money and this was D.B. Cooper the whole time. Because obviously if he died in 1974, he couldn't be the one disposing of the money. Exactly. So there must... So there must have been, it must have been like a multiple person operation. Yeah. I mean, he wants to go to Mexico, so it's obviously like, that's one of the highest crime places. So obviously he could, he could obviously find someone to help him do the job. Mm. He must have known people in Mexico or he must have been planning something in Mexico. Yeah, if he wanted to go there. Yeah, but he never got to Mexico. How do we know that? Exactly. No one, no one knows where he went. Maybe he, f- he had accomplices. We don't, we For don't know. We know. He could have died. He's probably he could have lived until 1944 when he died, which was when he <laughs> died. But anyways, let's see what he, what else he has to say about this guy one of the notes he'd given to a flight attendant he was only 29 years of age at the time yeah so yeah it's not yeah. him then because because in 1971 yeah db cooper was in his mid 40s 40s yeah so with him being even though this guy really matches the description but it can't be him with him being only 29 years of age there's there's no chance that he is it. So that's my suspicions gone. Same. Time of the hijacking, and all three flight attendants were quite certain that McCoy was not Cooper. While there are meaningful parallels between these two cases, McCoy might simply have been a copycat who'd read about D.B. Cooper in the news. No, duh. It's obvious he's a copycat. You just, you just mentioned it all already. Oh, he decided he decided to take a fake hand grenade, a gun. Use notes to communicate. Use notes to communicate with the flight attendants. The flight path. Flight. Yeah, exactly. So obviously, it's a copycat. It's not that hard to notice. Mm-hmm. Dwayne Weber first became a suspect in 1995 when short. Hmm. Okay, so D.B. Cooper is literally like the combination of the last three guys we've seen. I swear. Hmm. Like, I bet if you co- if you combine all three of them, it would be the exact person. I mean, look. First of all, this guy. This guy. Look at the eyes. Look at the eyes. The, yeah, the eyes match. Notice, notice how the one eye is uneven. On both of them. Yeah, the eyes match, the ears match, the eyebrows the nose matches. The eyebrows. The mouth matches, but the only thing that doesn't the, match. The lips don't and the chin the chin does. But but the and the hair doesn't though. Yeah. Is, is I mean more? Yeah. And this photograph was taken in 1966. 1966. I'm sorry, but why bring... He's too old. He's too old to be D.B. Cooper. Sorry, let me, let me just think about this for a minute. If, if, if that picture was taken in 1966, originally when the Adam West Batman came out, sorry, I had to mention that, even though that was completely irrelevant. Literally? Um, and the hijacking happened in 1971. Why? So no... five five years after. So the photograph was taken five years before. There's no way that that's DB Cooper. He looks. I think he's too old to be. Him. But DB Cooper is in his mid forties, and he looks about sixty or fifty in my my the way I put him. Around 55, I think. A good 10 years older. Exactly. In my opinion. Let's see what he has to say about dual 
L. Weber. Shortly before his death, he supposedly. Yeah, I can't read his name. Leave me alone. Dwayne. This... Stop. Leave me alone. Like Dwayne Johnson. <laughs> it was spelt different. Life. I've got a secret to tell you. Yo. I am done. <laughs> Right, Dwayne. Liar. What a liar. I've got a secret to tell you. I am I'm Dan Cooper. That's bull. That's bull. Mm. Cooper. Following his deathbed confession, Weber's widow recalled a number of fascinating details. She claims to have found a bank bag resembling the one used in the hijacking. She claims Weber had sustained a knee injury after jumping out of a plane. Weber supposedly had a nightmare about leaving his fingerprints on the aft stairs. And a year before the money was discovered at Tina Bar, Weber had allegedly paid a quick visit to the same location. In addition, Weber was a World War II veteran, he had an extensive criminal record, he matched the physical description, and he was 47 years old in 1971. I'm sorry, what? So wait, why, how did, why did you think he was 55? Wow, I feel so bad. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I mean, just I feel really bad. No, honestly, look at that picture for a minute. He looks about 55. Exactly, but in 1971, he was 47 years of age. And this was taken five years before that. Before 1971. So imagine what he looked like in five years later. <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's see what else there has to say. On the other hand, Weber's fingerprints did not match any of the prints collected from Flight 305. Although, to be fair, there's no way to know if any of those prints actually belonged to Cooper. Furthermore, Weber's DNA did not match a DNA sample collected from the tie clasp. But once again, there's no way to know if the DNA on the tie clasp actually came from the hijacker and not someone else. What's so frustrating is that the FBI likely had a much better source of DNA at one point. If you recall, eight cigarette butts were collected from the scene and there's a good chance they were all suffused with Cooper's DNA. The problem is, that evidence was lost at some point and has not turned up since. How do you lose evidence? Oh, for God's sake, the only bit of evidence that you have which has D.B. Cooper's DNA lost. <sighs> and that's, that is, that's embarrassing. That's actually embarrassing. That is it. That is, yeah. Oh my God. William Smith first became a suspect. I'm sorry, no. Wait, no, this was taken in, in 1985, so around 14 years after. I mean, first of all, let's just look at the resemblance. In 2018. Yeah. Yeah, he does look a lot. I mean, the face shape's a bit different. But I mean, he does look quite a lot like him. The hair is the same, the ears are the same, the nose is the same, the mouth is the same. And the eyes look exactly the, the same. Mm -hmm. So, it could be him. But is it? Because like, because like, like, like they said earlier. Well, as we know, he was never caught. That's why it's a cold case. But that's insane, though, how they look. Mm. But let's see what he has to say about William J. Smith. I'm actually getting really into this, I'm not going to lie. It's actually so interesting. Mm. Smith served in the Navy during World War II and likely had some experience with parachuting. He was 43 years old at the time of... Forty-three years old in nineteen seventy-one, and the resemblance looks 
perfect. Of the hijacking, he had dark brown oh, eyes. Dark brown eyes. But the guy looks like such a sweet old man. I can't. Hmm. He looks so sweet. I know. This Look at his face. He, lo he looks so innocent. He does. He had dark brown eyes. And obviously, I believe Akira is having some technical difficulties at the moment, so that's why her camera's off. But anyways. <laughs> yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, I feel so bad for him though. He's I feel like I feel like a guy who's last Listen, DB Cooper uh, he didn't he didn't harm anybody. Exactly. Like at all. All he did was get money and jump out of plane. Like but like he didn't harm anyone. So, I don't understand why the manhunt went over, went on for so long, like, I don't understand why they were so fascinated with this, like, he didn't hurt anyone to go to prison, I mean, like, it wasn't that bad for it to be a, a, over a decade of searching for this man. And yet this case is still unsolved to this very day. Yeah. That's interesting, but anyways, let's see what else he has to say. He matched the physical description, he shared a certain likeness with the composite sketches, especially this speculative sketch of an- Oh. My god. What the f- That's the same person. That is exactly the same person. Oh my god, I can feel my eyes starting to water now for like no reason. I feel so- Bro, so same! I saw you almost spit your tea out right now. Oh my god. You, you looked so shocked. I can't know. I, no, I actually can't believe that. What the hell? That picture was taken that is the same in person, 85. And that was taken a year after. No. Oh my god. That's the same person. I can't- I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't imagine that this man right here would be D.B. Cooper. Look, just look- okay, just, just look at him. Yeah, he looks so sweet. There's no chance. Older D.B. Cooper. A student named Ira Daniel Cooper, who was killed in World War II, attended the same high school as Smith. Smith worked as a yardmaster for a railroad company for most of his life, but in 1970 the company filed for bankruptcy. As a consequence, Smith lost his pension, which might suggest a motive. He could, for instance, have developed a grudge towards the airline industry for their role in bringing about the downfall of the rail transportation industry. It's further speculated that Smith could have used his knowledge of railroad networks to hop on a train and escape undetected. On the other hand, Smith spent his entire life in the northeastern United States. Given that the hijacking occurred on the other side of the country and was committed by someone who at least appeared to be familiar with the local terrain, Smith is not the most ideal candidate. However, the fact that Smith worked as a yardmaster is interesting. You see, the tie that Cooper left behind was recently examined using an electron microscope, which uncovered various metallic particles. Some of these particles, especially pure titanium, were quite rare in 1971. This might suggest that Cooper worked as a manager at some sort of chemical or metallurgical facility. Or possibly, a rail yard. Dang. If nothing else, I hope this limit- Well, that's the whole video. Give me I'm... a second, I'll put my camera back on. I am so sorry that that- That took so long. I'm pretty sure Ages. we've been filming. We've been but... filming for like over an hour and a half now, I'm pretty sure. But... 
that last picture though it really it's it just really gets to me it's actually making me really upset It was a bit shocking, actually. You okay, Luca? You want to drink your tea a little bit? That's actually shocking, though. I'm not going to lie. That is... That's unbelievable. I mean... It's a, the sketch of D.B. Cooper and having... Jay Smith next to that. It's just a perfect relentless. As the fact that he knew someone, well, he may have known someone who died called, I can't remember what his first name was, but it was something Daniel Cooper. Daniel, yeah, Daniel Cooper. I mean, so we know where the name came from if, if it was him. I mean, Let's just let's just think about this for a minute. It could be possible that William J. Smith could be DB Cooper. Cooper. Mm -hmm. As well, he he obviously knew about the roots. He obviously knew what he wanted he obviously knew everything and what he wanted to do <laughs> and that is actually really fascinating to know but to this very day db cooper has never been found it still remains a cold case but anyways, again, I do apologize for how long this video was. If you managed to get like to I mentioned if, Luca's fault. If you managed to get to the end of this video, I congratulate you. But anyways, guys, if you If you got to the end, comment a what emoji should they comment? A rocket. Comment a rocket. Yeah. But anyways, guys, if you have enjoyed this video and you want to see more of these fascinating cold cases, like, for example, if you want us to do one on Jack the Ripper or any cold cases mm -hmm. that you want us to do, or if you have any other suggestions on crimes that have never been solved and you want us to try to solve them, which we won't, <laughs> Let us know down in the comment section down below. Make sure you guys go press that subscribe button. Press that bell icon next to the subscribe button. We should get you notified whenever I upload a new video. Stay awesome boy puts and stay cool girl puts. And I'll see you guys in my next video.